intellectual deficiencies, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships, and above all, above all else, above all, Yabun Banania. As Boclet reminds us, Léopold Sédar Senghor, dubbed one of the fathers of negritude, declared in 1948, so 100 years after the abolition of slavery in the French West Indies, um, I will rip up all the banania smiles from all the walls of France. It wasn't until about 10 years ago that banania decided to modify the banania man by giving him a more useful um, appearance. However, the old design is seen and bought everywhere on mugs, boxes, aprons, posters, postcards. All in all, those is indicate that the memory of slavery and colonialism is easier to stomach when the black body can actually be literally consumed. In this short presentation, I have attempted to demonstrate how Jean-Francois Boucle's performative use of collected objects enables him to reclaim silence histories, memories, and Martinican trajectories as muted identity. I tried to show how his pieces create an artistic <coughs> language that shows the seemingly immutable nature of the tensions revealed by the display of colonial history. By resorting to the poetics of La Récup to contest the main narrative, Boclet might open a much needed dialogue about the absence and presence of the African diaspora within world history. Okay, so we have 15 minutes for questions. What? Jeanette? Yeah. Jeanette? Oh, Jeanne. Oh, Jeanne. Jeanne. Oh, okay, Jeanne. Jeanne Jean. 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 <laughs> uh, I have a question about that. I never saw this this uh, representation of Banana Man. It's, it's, it's a soldier, uh, maybe it's a the French Army or yes, something uh, like that? Yes, a Senegalese troop, a Senegalese foot okay. soldier. It was done in 1915, uh, actually, yes, the day you in there. Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering why they would choose the image of a, of a soldier to represent banana man. I mean, for instance, like so, uh, they, here in the United yeah. States, they, they mm -hmm. have the Aunt Jemima image, you know, the, the, the black servant, etc. So why would they choose that image to represent banana? Oh, so it's banana, so it's chocolate, right? So it's a reference to chocolate, not necessarily to banana. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> But there's a, obviously like a, um, yes, there's an audible resemblance with the banana, actually. But think about the connection between France, because this is a French ad, the mm -hmm. connection between France and its colony, and this desire to actually uh, encourage or justify the colonizing project to the population and to make the black body more um, understandable to the French population. So the idea also with Yabon, Yabon is actually broken French, yeah, right? So you have the connection between uh, the black body and the incapability to be assimilated within the French population. And what actually happened with these foot soldiers, who were, some of them were actually located in France, is that the generals, I mean the people in the French army, would purposefully teach them broken French so that they could not communicate with the mm -hmm. French population. Mm. So this is the image that is actually uh, evoked in that, um, in that chocolate powder box. Okay, thank yes. you. Sure. Can I jump in? Because actually Roland Barthes writes about this kind of illustration as participating in the myth, the colonial myth of France, that these soldiers, and, and there were representations like this in advertising, but also in newspapers, uh, this is the ima image of, of assimilation. That's the image that colonialism brings you uh, modernity, it brings, and it brings these African uh, population into modernity, and it assimilate, assimilate them, potentially, into a useful role within the French Republic. Uh -huh. So that's why they picked a, a black soldier okay. as a, a marketing campaign, because it, it participates in this myth building around uh, uh, French colonialism. Thank you. On, on from there, this um, is again a matter of more of psychology, I think, to understand this. But back in the 1940s oh, or so, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, in Central Europe, you had uh, chocolate, and this was with Sarotti. And it was a Sarotti boy, and that was, yes, a black African. 
and never clear why one would have a black African face that would have to go with whatever chocolate they ate. But there was a Sarotti boy. Ah. But it, it, I think only psychologists will understand, if they ever understand what's going on. Well, you know, just adding, I don't want to dominate time, but this struck is an interesting anecdote. When I was in France for the first time, when was that? Uh, way back in the 60s, uh, I was uh, sitting at a, a rugby game, and uh, this little boy was dragging his mother. She wanted, he wanted to sit next to me for some reason or another. And he sat next to me. He made believe I wasn't there. But then, after about 30 seconds, he looked up at me and said, Bonjour, Monsieur de Chocolat. <laughs> no, you see, that's exactly <laughs> which, right. Yeah, which, which is interesting because that's exactly uh, in the right. Yeah, another uh, African guy from Ghana. I met. He, he, there used to be a fair where they would demonstrate um, their products. You know, I said, "I'm from Ghana. This is the uh, this is my this is what we do in Ghana. These are some crafts from Ghana." And a little boy asked him if he drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> or if his father owned himself, does your father own a coffee plantation? And he said, no. And he said, well, you drink a lot of coffee? And he says, not really. He says, one or two cups a day. And the, the little kid said, well, how come you're so black? <laughs> so I, I think uh, a, lo a lot of times, uh, actually white, white families, parents teach their children that people are black because they drink coffee or because they eat chocolate or whatnot. So that's where the association comes in. Mm. Uh, I had a question for both of you. Uh, thank you both for your presentation. This is really rich material. Um, you both engage with Lisson's idea of opacity. Uh, and you, you engage with what I understand as being one aspect of opacity, which is, you know, in the poetics of relation where Lisson is arguing for a melting of intersubjectivity, Opacity is what prevents homogenization and the total loss of the self. Um, and he traces the idea to a sort of a resistance to the colonial and the ethnographic gaze. But the other idea in opacity is that uh, throughout the colonial period, power was maintained by um, the, uh, the plantation owners and then the colonial powers of actual exhibitionism that they have, these people have to be seen all the time to maintain their, their uh, grasp on power, uh, which is something that you, you did not engage with, and I was wondering if you could, you know, both of you either or engage with that aspect of audacity, which is a demand for a more equal way of seeing and of being seen. The demand that the person who has been perpetrating the gaze up to a certain point now accepts being looked at. So how does this work for the visual artist with whom, uh, upon, you know, uh, when you were writing like that? Can I bring, I'll bring it back. Yes. Okay. Just looking at this image again, um, when I was talking about um, inhabiting um, the space of um, of exposure and obscurity, uh, like wanting to be seen but not, but uh, only enough to show that you're not showing all. Um, so these. Uh, <coughs> this masking uh, is demanding visibility in, in a way to participate at, for representation in a society, but only to a certain point, but still maintaining that opacity in order to have uh, the self not be completely taken over by the colonizer. But the visibility is necessary in order to demand the, uh, representation or to um, make visible um, the, the injustices that have been suffered. <laughs> um, yeah, that right uh, to opacity, um, again, the right to non solidization from another point, and the reason why I focus on this aspect is that uh, with conversation that I had with West uh, 
West Indians, French West Indian artists, that always say that um, the relationship between the colony, I mean, that's why I kept referring to the colony, right, instead of overseas territory. They say that, yeah, the, 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 dynamic, the power dynamics have not shifted at all, and they are always seen as, um, um, that's always seen within a colonial framework, whereas um, the metropole is overrepresented within their own culture. So I'm not sure if I'm answering uh, your question, but this is why I really wanted to focus on how artists want to have their own language and own their own representation without so much want, um, wanting to focus on the metropole itself. Yeah, I, I uh, will also thank you for both presentations, really, really interesting. Yeah, but um, I, I wonder if you can comment on either if, if you collected information on, on the impact of this exhibit on the audience, like, or, or if not, you can speculate on that, because uh, you have the, the power of images that are so, so strong, uh, and then you're you're bringing that to the contemporary context and, and try to link that with things that are going on now. Like, um, you have something that is uh, aesthetically appealing, like the, the ones that you showed about the, the fragility of smiles of, of strangers, also the, the titles, the captures, mm -hmm. you know, that you see something uh, aesthetically appealing and then you get closer and then it hits you in the face. So uh, if you can comment on that. Um, so, as for the images that I showed, I mean, Beaucle's art and the way that he's received uh, by a French audience, you notice that, I mean, I don't know if you notice if I actually showed where most of the pieces were shown. Uh, lots of them are, were shown outside of France, actually, in other European places or in the Caribbean or in Latin America. And he was always telling, I mean, the conversation that he had with the proud descendant of enslavers was pretty clear. It was forget about the past. And this is why the commemoration of slavery and the history of colonialism had to be written into law for uh, people to add it to textbook and make it part of the French narrative. But this is still extremely um, controversial. And he's not necessarily positively uh, received by the French audience who don't want to be bothered with that history, and who, again, the reaction is forget about that was the past, so. Um, and this, I, uh, all I, all I have um, is the review that was done of the work that when it was shown in Canada, which the title was Not for the Faint of Heart. Mm -hmm. So I think the review took into account that this is a very difficult, um, uh, it's a difficult, exhibit to see, especially when you're looking at the text in relation to the drawings. Um, but I do think that the, the images initially draw in the viewer and they're kind of intrigued or they want to know, know more. And actually the, di um, the analysis of the diary that I mentioned, Mastery, Tyranny, and Desire, uh, is, um, is a very enthralling book. It, it has you keep reading, but it's documenting page after page of these uh, terrible um, atrocities. And similar to um, the abolitionist consumption of these images for, for good, like the, the images um, of the five years, five year expedition were circulated and, um, and they were read by, by many people. I think that sometimes, um, the violence of the images is, dis, is uh, disconnected from the stories. And this work is precisely to bring the text, to collide the text with the images so that um, people do not um, forget. I have a question for Jean. Um, I really like the, the presentation, and uh, I had heard this artist and his work seems really fascinating. And I wonder if, so in the, um, the pieces that had to do with bananas, um, there's an obvious, uh, there an obvious sort of dense um, concentration of social and environmental uh, issues, among other things, um, at, at play there. And I'm wondering if some of those same environmental concerns um, could be read into the piece about the boat. Um, 
you, know, you, you talked, you alluded, and then talked a little bit, uh, talked a little bit about uh, the importance of using uh, found objects, of using things that have been thrown away, um, and and so I wonder if using all those cardboard boxes and thinking about uh, the impact of consumer society and industrialism, uh, how how that manifests itself in Martinique, and so why use boxes that things are shipped in particularly, and what that, what that might not only say about the Middle Passage and the history of slavery and oppression, but also current environmental issues in Martinique. Well, I'm not um, completely, uh, I don't know that much about environmental issues, even though I know that they do exist. But there's another piece that might be of interest to you where uh, he uses uh, plastic bags, right, to uh, characterize the sea, right? And the use of all these plastic bags kind of, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of mimics uh, the ocean. So it's also denouncing the overuse of um, ecological, environmental issues in that in that one piece. But I would not be able to say how it applies specifically to Martinique. Okay. Um, yes. Or maybe to a, a larger uh, West Indian context. I don't, I don't know if that. Yeah. But thank you very much. That. Can I ask about uh, uh, the reception that Gardner's work has had in the Caribbean itself? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it must have actually had reverberations back in the, uh, in the region. And uh, have you read anything uh, that's been written about it in Jamaica or Barbados? I haven't. I know that it has been, um, it has been exhibited once in the Caribbean, but, um, or Where? the specific. In which are? Uh, I don't, I don't remember right now, but um, no, I will, um, yes. I will look at it. It would seem like, just to follow up, it, was, it would seem that because Thistlewood's mm -hmm. experience was on Jamaica, that mm -hmm. it, it would have a greater impact there mm -hmm. in conversation with the, uh, with the uh, Trevor Bernard book. Mm -hmm. They both came out the same year. Mm -hmm. They were both the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since no one else is speaking, I'll keep asking questions. Uh, this is also a question for you, Nicole. Um, in keeping up with this idea of audience and how this, these works are, are, are uh, received, I, I couldn't help but be a little shocked by the picture that you have on your slide uh, with the title, Not for the Faint of Heart which I imagine is a picture of the artist herself by a work. And to me, there's a weird dissonance there between this smiling white woman uh, next to this particular piece of work. Um, am I the only one who, to see that and to be a little disturbed by it? And, and I wonder if, if you've encountered responses to, to that particular representation. I mean, this uh, is weird, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I haven't used this image <laughs> yet. Was uh, this published in a newspaper? Or? Uh, it was. It was along with the article of uh, the I mean, review. This is like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not for the faint of heart, but you're a suburban mom and she's very happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, I, I, to be honest, my initial reaction was this image and just um, this project was uh, more critical of the artist's position. But um, but she is very, she's exploring um, dissociation and white culpability and her role in all of this and in other, um, and sometimes I think that um, the t her, I, uh, some of the works focus on feminism uh, at the expense of other uh, um, inequalities and that was a criticism that I have for, uh, that I, or something that I um, sometimes Thought took away from other arguments, um, but I, I think from when I really um, worked with her piece, I think that she it's an honest gesture to explore her position without ignoring the privilege that that involves, and that's kind of an intellectual position that I, I myself am in, and that I also encounter um, the same issues of talking about very uh, traumatic issues and having the right tone or how you deal with that in a, in, in a 